Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much for joining us for the Coconut Grove Nightclub Fire presentation from Stephanie Scurro on November 28th, 1942. So 80 weeks, uh, 80 weeks, oh boy, 80 years this week, uh, fire roared through Boston's famed Coconut Grove Nightclub during what was supposed to be a high-spirited Saturday night. By midnight, more than 500 people were dead, dying, or maimed for life. Uh, Stephanie uh, probes the uh, club's history, the circumstances leading to the fire, and the tragedy's lingering impact in her uh, new book, uh, or her updated, revised uh, new book here, new, new edition, The Coconut Grove Nightclub Fire, A Boston Tragedy. Uh, Stephanie is a journalist, writing instructor, and author or co-author of seven books on Boston history, including The Great Boston Fire, Inside the Combat Zone, Drinking Boston, A History of the City and Its Spirits, Boston on Fire, A History of Fires and Firefighting in Boston, uh, East of Boston, Notes from the Harbor Island, The Crime of the Century, How the Brinks Robbers Stole Millions in the Hearts of Boston, uh, The Boston Mob Guide, Hitman, hood Hoodlums, and Hideouts. And I think we might have had you talk uh, here for all those books, Stephanie. Uh, Stephanie has worked as an editor and a reporter for the Boston Herald and the Associated Press. Again, want to thank the friends of the Tewksbury Library and the eight other partnering libraries for helping make, make tonight's program possible. So all 134 of us, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Stephanie for joining us here tonight. And Stephanie, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Great, thank you, thank you, uh, Robert. I really appreciate this chance to talk about this fire, particularly in this week, which is the 80th anniversary of it. Uh, and I'm very happy to be here and try to share this information uh, that I've gathered on this fire. Uh, this has been an obsession of mine for maybe for more than 10 years, 10, 15 years. Uh, and I'll kind of explain that and unpack that a little bit. But first of all, I wanna thank you for being here. Uh, I'm going to share my screen now and hopefully everything will work out the way it's supposed to. So let me do this. We start here and that's not working out. So let me try that again. Hold on. We will exit. We will start at the beginning and go to the very end. So try that again, share screen, share, share. And uh, presentation. Okay, do we see the first slide there? I see. Yeah, that's Steph perfect, Stephanie. Thanks so much. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, so we were gonna we're gonna we're gonna spend some time remembering the Coconut Fire Grove Fire. I think many of you may know about that fire, and I'm gonna try to give enough for those of you who don't know what the fire is a little background. But I really want to concentrate in some of the new information about this fire. And, and, and this goes to the point of this talk, which is why update a book about an event 80 years old. And I think it underscores something I emphasize in all my talks that the past is never really past. It continues to catch up with us, with us. It continues to have an effect on our lives. Now, I think I mentioned a, a number of my books and um, I have written a book on the Coconut Grove fire before. It was a very sh um, short book. And for the 80th anniversary, I wanted to update it. And you might say, why? Well, these are some of the reasons why. Because people kept coming up to me with stories about the Grove. Either they were there or family members were there, great aunts, great uncles. They came with artifacts. They came with um, little recordings. They came with photographs. And I just kept saying, there's more to this story. This fire had a, an impact on the city of Boston and surrounding areas that far outweighed any other event in this area. And it, even though a lot of people know about this fire, it hasn't had the kind of recognition in Boston that it deserves until uh, probably next year. So we'll see that. Um, one example of this is I was doing a talk um, for an Irish group. And just before the talk, someone emailed me this picture of her husband's uncle who died in the grove that night. Um, I, didn't, I didn't know about this, but she, she sent in the store and I thought, wow, that's amazing. And I know there are people in the audience here right now that you have stories to, to share. I'm not sure we can get to all of them, but 
but may, may I ask that you preserve them, hold on to them, because there may be opportunity to do more work in terms of making sure the victims and survivors of the Grove are not forgotten. So let me go into some background about the Grove. So the Coconut Grove was approximately here. This is in the Bay Village area of Boston, um, church surrounded by Church Street, and at one point, Broadway and um, Piedmont Street. So the these uh, the club was in, uh, here's another picture, you can really get a sense of it, um, was, didn't look that glamorous from the outside, but it was considered one of the most hot spot, the great biggest hot spot, the most glamorous place to be in Boston. Um, it was actually created and founded in a former garage building by these two gentlemen, Jacques Renard and Mickey Alpert. Um, here they are, 1927, it was opened. Um, and it very soon became uh, a place to see and be seen. It was modeled after the Coconut Grove in Los Angeles. This is a postcard of the Coconut Grove in Los Angeles. I haven't found any postcards of the one in Boston, but it, it picked up that same kind of theme. So it had dancing, it had entertainment, um, it had um, uh, kind of the South Seas theme. Um, it had um, a main entrance that you can see uh, in the picture here, where people would go through a revolving door into a dining area. Um, there was also bars upstairs and downstairs. Now, here's the thing about opening a nightclub in 1927. There was one insurmountable barrier to making a profit. And that, of course, was prohibition. So the two, uh, Jacques Renard and Mickey Alpert, just could not make a go of it. There were a lot of shenanigans around this. So eventually they had to sell, sell out to this gentleman here, a, a man named Charles King Solomon. That was his nickname. And he was, how shall I put this, a gangster. He was um, ran a lot of the, um, what the, we used to call rum running and other enterprises in the Boston area. But he was a gangster right out of uh, central casting. He'd, he'd wear these dapper suits. Uh, he would hobnob with people and he was very well known in Boston. Unfortunately, King Solomon had a lot of en enemies. So one night at another club, he was ambushed and robbed uh, and shot. Uh, he staggered out as the thieves staggered, uh, ran out. He staggered out clutching his gut saying, the dirty rats, they got me. Or so the Boston Herald reported. So you know it's true. But the point being is that uh, uh, King Solomon set a tone for operations in the Coconut Grove, somewhat a little bit shady. For one thing, he always kept doors locked. And you can see why he did. He was always worried about people ambushing him. But he was also concerned about people not paying their bills. But unfortunately, that turned out to be a fatal mistake the night of the fire. By the way, here's his funeral. You can see he was, was quite a well-known gentleman. So what happened? So uh, that happened in 1933. And um, the club was taken over by this gentleman named uh, Barnett Wolanski. Barnett Wolanski was Solomon's lawyer and a very well-trained lawyer uh, in that. He took over the Coconut Grove. He expanded it. He made it more of a business than a showcase for the kind of things that Solomon used to do. And he was considered a pretty good businessman. He helped, he, he, he was considered a fair boss, uh, even though he kept up the habits of keeping doors locked. He did not want to lose any money. But here's the interesting thing about uh, Barney Willett, as they call uh, Barney Wolanski, is that he had a brother, James, James Wolanski, who was more of, well, let's, how do we call this again? A gangster. Um, and it, I, I know you might find it odd that in Boston, there'd be one brother that was on one side, the right side of the law, and another brother on the other side of the law. I, surprise, surprise in Boston. But that was the situation with the Wolanskis. But they basically helped to run this club. And as you can see from this uh, floor plan, it was quite a complex. It wasn't just one a room. It was a series of rooms, which is, is very important to understand the dynamics of the fire. It had a dance floor, it had a, uh, a bar off the dance floor, it had a new bar. This, what we're seeing here, if you can see this cocktail lounge here, uh, people call it the Broadway Lounge, but it was new. It was open like 10 days before the fire. And then downstairs here, right, if you come in, this is the um, 
hope you can see my pointer here. If you go in the revolving door, this is the main entrance, you could go downstairs into something called the Melody Lounge, which is uh, another bar. Uh, there was only one entrance into this new lounge over here, which was the Cocktail Lounge, which is right here. And this area here was just a warren of passageways and the staff could pass that way, but patrons couldn't. So keep all that in mind when we talk about the fire. And as I said, that new lounge, was okay just a few weeks before the, the fire. So let's talk about the night of November 28th, 1942. It was a very cold night in Boston. Um, there, were a lot, there were a lot of things going on. For example, that day in Fenway Park, no less, was a very important football game being played between Holy Cross and Boston College. Now the, whole, the uh, Boston College Eagers, Eagles were the favorite. In fact, everyone knew they were going to win. They had had a perfect season. They were going to, they're going to romp right over Holy Cross, and go to the go to one of the bowls, maybe the Sugar Bowl. And so the Fenway Park was packed with people who wanted to see this very important college football game. Well, um, the football gods are fickle, and the uh, Boston uh, College Eagles ended up losing to Holy Cross, fifty-five to twelve. It was quite a rout and um, it's considered, actually today it's considered one of the greatest losses in college football history. But it, it made for a very sad um, uh, situation at Boston College. Now, we'll talk about whether they were Boston College officials planned for a victory celebration at the Coconut Grove that night and canceled it because they lost so badly. Hold that thought. Because that's something that's been said about this fire over and over again, and we're going to talk about it in just a minute. But that night, even though a lot of Boston College uh, officials didn't go to the club or, or, weren't, or didn't think about going out, they were just miserable, lots of people went to the Coconut Grove that night, including entertainers like this gentleman, Jack Lesberg, who was a famous jazz um, uh, bassist. This was Dottie Lanes, who was a, a singer. Uh, Goody Goodell, another singer. There were many, many entertainers in that club, and there were waiters and and, maitre, and the maitre d's and bus boys, and there were hundreds of patrons. In fact, literally hundreds. At least a thousand people crowded into that club that night. That include um, and people celebrating anniversaries, uh, uh, couples on dates soldiers, sailors who were in, I mean, remember the war was going on, 1942, there was a World War II was going on, um, but the soldiers, sailors on leave would go into the club. Um, there were whole families, families, people, uh, uh, teenagers as young as 15 years old, brought by their parents to go out for a night in the evening. So the people were looking forward to a wonderful evening at the club. And then there was one celebrity there, and that was this gentleman, Buck Jones who was a cowboy star who um, was in more than, you can say in the next slide, but more than 166 Westerns. And he was extremely popular. I, we don't know much of him today, but he really was um, someone who was loved by many kids around the country who belonged to the Buck Jones Rangers, his fan club, and who went to his Saturday matinee movies over and over again. And one of the reasons I wanted to do this book was that I was, I was kind of interested in this guy, Buck Jones. I didn't know much about him. And so I did some research on him. And it, it's interesting because he actually was an actual cowboy who kind of fell into the movie business. Um, he, was, he was in Boston to promote um, not only his new movie, he had a couple of new movies out, but he's also promoting war bonds. He was promoting the war effort. And so he spent the day doing promotional events at um, the uh, at, at hospital, for example, he went to a hospital to entertain um, sick kids. He went to the Boston Garden to do a show, um, signed autographs. And that night he was just really weary. And he said, I'll cancel my last event. I'm feeling sick. But the movie officials uh, in town, they really wanted to show Buck Jones a good time. So he was convinced to go to the Coconut Grove that night, even though he didn't really want to do anything. But he kind of said, well, I feel obligated, so I'm going to go to the club that night. And so he was there. So let's look at the timeline. Around 10 o'clock in this very, very packed club in the downstairs lounge, which was called the Melody Lounge, very, it was again, tightly packed. A soldier or somebody, we're never sure who, 
pulled out a light bulb out of uh, one of the palm trees, had palm trees, and, it's, and he wanted a little more, more darkness. And for a joke, he sort of unscrewed a light bulb. And um, the bartender told the busboy, go put the bulb back in. Can't, can't have that. So the busboy went to that spot, couldn't see where the bulb went in. It kind of came out in his hand. So he lit a match to see where the bulb was. And so he put the bulb back in. That's when fire was seen in the palm tree where the bulb was. And at first it was kind of funny, but then the fire began to spread. It spread over the ceiling of this downstairs lounge, which was covered with cloth. So in about three minutes, fire had spread from the downstairs lounge upstairs into the main dining room. And people were busy scrambling, trying to get out. But the fire was relentless. It spread from the downstairs into the main dining room and then all the way into the Broadway lounge in just a few minutes. The first victims of the fire were actually in the hospital by 1035. And here's the interesting thing. The fire was out by 10, 1045 PM. I'm gonna to try to play you a little video. This is from Marshall Cole. Uh, this was shot a few years ago. There's a lot of background, so let's see if we can get it. But he was a tap dancer. He was a kid, but he, he worked at the club as a tap dancer. And he was upstairs in his dressing room. It was between shows when he heard there was a fire. And you'll hear me asking him the question. And let's see if we can hear what he what he says. When did you know something was wrong? Well, when I heard some rumbling, I was up in my dressing room. That was on the roof level. And I heard some commotion. So I opened up the door to look down to see what was going on down below. I figured there would be a big fight. It was a football, and there was a, a rumble. Well, uh, as I went down the stairs, all of a sudden there was a big cloud of smoke and sparks and the flames and the smoke. So I said, ooh, I'm going to go back to my third dressing room, and I'm going to get my stuff gathered all up, my tap shoes, my tuxedo, my camel hair coat, which was uh, my pride and joy, and I was going to go off the roof, and I figured that's where I had to go off the roof because I wasn't going down there, down below. When a man comes through the door, running, put his hands and rewrites the window, took it right out. And of course, when I saw that, and the smoke behind him, I said, this is no place for Marshall Poe. <laughs> I'm getting out of here fast, so I followed him through the window. But by that time, the chorus girls and everybody came out behind me as I went out through the window. And of course, we were looking for a way to get off the roof. We had to get off the roof. So when you get off the roof, I knew there was flames to the left of me because that's where I saw the smoke and the flames. But then there was flames at the other end too. And I'm saying, oh my God, there's fire everywhere. There's fire underneath me. There must be fire. We got to get off here fast. So we found a ladder, small ladder that fell short. Hey, sorry to cut that off, but basically um, he was able to what? he was able to escape and was able to tell the story years later. This what I'm showing you right now is actually in the Melody Lounge, and I'm showing you the corner where the fire began. That's the remains of that palm tree where the light was. And um, there's some peculiar things about this. You'll notice there's a lot of stuff still left in this room, furniture and other things. Um, but this is the trajectory of the fire. It basically started in the downstairs Melody Lounge, came up the stairs, actually came upstairs and then rushed into the bar, this bar area and it went all the way into that new lounge. And that, and it did that at an amazingly, incredibly fast speed, that a speed that still baffles people today. Here's a picture of the club on fire. Firefighters were there on the scene very quickly. By coincidence, they were actually at a fire nearby. They came in and they were able to put the fire out fairly quickly, but not before they, know, they, they had a problem at the front gate. You see a lot of people in situations like that, go out the way they came in. And most of those people in the main dining area came in the revolving door, that the door that's right under this sign here. 
And that's the main entrance to the club. So many people were trying to rush out that it jammed. It got stuck and people could not get out and literally burned to death as firefighters were trying to, to break through to help them. The problem with the Coconut Grove, the reason there were so many deaths is because there was something functionally wrong with almost every exit in this area. I mentioned the, the revolving door, it jammed. The people who ran up here from the Melody Lounge ran up, there was actually a door right where this little red thing is, which was a safety door, was supposed to push open. It didn't open, it was jammed, it was locked or bolted shut, they couldn't get open. So many people died there. Uh, people had trouble getting out this door because it was locked. There was an exit over here that was blocked. The, one of the saddest things was in the, this new cocktail lounge. You can see that there's two doors leading in, one that goes inward with, oops, sorry, inward with the force of egress, and then a door here that opens into the club. And what happened, there were so many people that they pushed that door shut and jammed it and could not get out there. Here are some photos of the club, af obviously after the fire, but you can see the devastation there. Here's the interesting thing though. Um, there's still a lot of combustibles in, this, in these pictures and in these fires. The fire, even though it was described as a huge ball of fire that rushed through the area, felled people, people just fell down where they were because of the, not only the smoke uh, and the fire, but the uh, problems with breathing, uh, a lack, even a lack of oxygen because the fire was sucking up all the oxygen, but it didn't burn everything. And that's one, again, one of the peculiar things about this fire is that it didn't re reach what firefighters would call a flashover. If you're familiar with the station nightclub fire, you will know that that was a flashover fire where everything burned. That did not happen in this fire. It just moved, the, the, the fire moved in this fireball fashion throughout the club. And then the rescue efforts began, and then there was frantic effort to get every, everybody out of the club. At that point, the, the first headlines were that the bus boys match caused this fire. Um, but of course, um, that didn't matter initially because there was just huge amounts of death. And here are some of the pictures of some of the people who died. This is why this fire was so hard for me to, to write about. It was over and over seeing these faces and hearing about these people and hearing these stories um, nearly the, the final death toll, which there's some difficulty in establishing that was 490 people who died, some of them some months later. There were many, there were hundreds injured and there was many, many people were scarred for life, even if they got out without an injury because they had psychological problems. Buck Jones, this cowboy star died in the fire. And it's, it's ironic because he was a guy who was most comfortable on a horse on the range by the ocean, he was a nightclub kind of guy, but he died in, in the nightclub fire. A number of things came out of this. Many of the people were rushed to the old Boston City Hospital, to Mass General Hospital, and um, it was a huge influx of patients. Um, by, by a good fortune, the staffs of these hospitals had been training for wartime, so they were prepared to deal with uh, a large influx of patients, better than you might might think, even though they struggled. Um, innovations were made in terms of burn treatment. They tried new ways of treating some of these burn, treat, uh, burn patients. There were new ways to treat lung patients. So a lot of discoveries and a lot of new techniques came out of, out of this fire. Um, one, of the, one of the survivors committed suicide and that also generated a whole uh, discipline of looking at trauma as something that affects you not only physically, but mentally. And now we talk about post-traumatic tra uh, trauma, but at the time that, was, that, that word wasn't even known. But through studies of some of the survivors of the Coconut Grove, we gained insight into how a terrible event can affect a person, even if they're not physically harmed, but the mind and the body are connected. Um, so now this slide, got it kind of screwed up there, but what caused the fire? Um, obviously at the beginning, everyone said the match caused the fire. It seemed very obvious, they lit the match and it spread, but people were very impressed with this bus boy whose name was Stanley Tomachevsky. He was only about uh, 16 years, 15, 16 years old. Uh, he was working to support his family. 
He came to the police. He talked very forthrightly about what happened. And there was a feeling that how could all of this destruction happen with just one match? There had to be something else. And so over the years, um, other theories have emerged. There were some theories that there was a burning film, that, that the building had been a film depository and the building had been a film depository. And they thought, well, maybe that was that some pieces of the film had caught. Maybe there was combustion from all the furnishings. Maybe there was even sabotage by German agents or Olansky's uh, gangster. Um, there was a theory, this came later about methyl chloride, which is a gas that might've been used in a refrigerator unit. Maybe that, that ignited and created that fireball that rushed through the, the club. We don't know. In fact, we may never know what caused because the official conclusion is that this fire is of unknown origin and Marshal Stephen Garrity even exonerated Stanley, who said, no, he could not have caused all this damage. Let me see if I can play this because here's the thing about poor Stanley. Stanley was blamed by the population of, of Boston, even if he was exonerated by the officials. I was giving a talk in Hull about this fire and a man just jumped up and started talking about his relative, Stanley Tomachewski. And um, I managed to catch, I'll just play a little bit. I managed to catch him on film. So if you're any researchers in the audience, always keep your, your phone handy. And uh, I recorded him. I never did get his name. It's like, I don't know what he, who, uh, what, what, uh, even anything about it, but he was 89 years old and he felt in, compelled to defend Stanley. Well, I need to tell you, Stanley was a hard worker. His father was unemployed. He was trying to help his mother out. Saturday morning, he would get the wagon. He'd go out selling fruit and vegetables. At night, he went to the company group, making himself a few bucks for his mother. He ended up being a captain in the army, had a very successful life, being a, uh, did handle all kinds of books for big companies, and I visited him so many times and he just was so, felt so bad that he could blame and people were spitting on him and calling him at all hours of the morning to blast him out, being the culprit. And it wasn't so. Uh, I'm only 89 and I'm still enjoying my life. And it's so nice to speak my piece here. God love you, Stanley. I found that to be very moving. Um, as I mentioned, a number of very good um, innovations came out of this fire. I mentioned the burn and lung treatments. There was also legal precedents um, that came out of this. Um, there was a, I'm gonna talk about the trial, but basically the idea that keeping a business in an unsafe condition and if there's deaths or you can be held liable for manslaughter was a very key part. It's, it's a this fire set of precedents has been used over and over again. The other thing is about safety rule enforcement. And, and let, me, let me emphasize this, that, that it's not that before the fire that you, that the um, public, that, they, that, law, that the uh, builders didn't know that revolving doors, for example, should be flanked with swing doors because if the revolving door jams, there's another way to get out. People knew that was, and in fact, it had been recommended that that be the standard in buildings throughout Boston. However, there was not the political will to enforce that. But after this fire, many um, businesses took these regulations seriously and inspectors took them even more seriously. For example, today, even today, the inspectors and police are very careful not to have clubs overcrowded in Boston. As I said, Almost a thousand people were crammed into that club that night. It was licensed for 500. It was just packed beyond, 
capacity. And so today there are rules about overcrowding. There are rules about proper um, exit. There is a, a rule that a business such as a restaurant or nightclub can be considered a place of assembly and therefore is subject to greater safety regulations. All that came out of the Coconut Grove fire. Lewanski was found guilty of manslaughter. He was the only person, Barnett Lewanski, the owner of the club, who was not even at the club that night because he was out sick, was the only one convicted for this fire. He was convicted of manslaughter. And that was because he was he kept the club in an unsafe situation, um, and he but he he only spent a few years in day in jail. He was pardoned, and but he died a few years after that. So one of the things that's propelled me to keep coming back to this fire is this are these are these myths, and I've just listed a, a few of them here. Um, I can I can tell you one thing, Buck Jones. It's been said he ran back and forth to save people. Not so that didn't happen. Um, did the city pass a law saying no Boston Club could ever be called the Coconut Grove? We're not sure about that. Probably not. But it was a, it was an unacknowledged practice that was going on. And then let's that that Boston College party. Let me talk about that. Um, it's interesting because I was convinced that Boston College was planning a party at the Coconut Grove that night. And Boston College team, they were going to go there, they're going to have a great time, and then they lost terribly, so they canceled their plans. And in fact, this woman, who is quoted in my book, read from the diary of her father, who had many ties to Boston College, and he talks about, I'm not going to play it, it's a little long, but he, ta he talked about how um, the, they were devastated by this loss, and then the fire came along, and it sort of put it into perspective, but they were very grateful that they had lost because they would have been at the club and there would have been a great, great loss of life. In fact, however, um, someone in the on the Monday after the fire, um, Coach Denny Myers gave a talk to a group of Boston College alumni, and he um, insisted that they were going to go to the Coconut Grove. They didn't. And obviously, God was looking out for them. It was an act of God. It was the hands of providence that intervened to help Boston College on that. Now, truly that always bothered me because I don't, I don't really quite understand why, why God would take the part of Boston College over Holy Cross. It just didn't seem logical. And over the years I would hear about, well, no, they weren't going to go there. And we keep, I kept seeing stories about, well, no, actually they weren't going to go to the, the, the team was not going to go to the Coconut Grove that night. They actually went to a party at the Statler Hotel uh, which is now uh, Park Plaza Hotel. Um, and, but perhaps some of the members of the team were going to go to the Coconut Grove later, but just didn't. So this idea that um, God was looking out for Boston College is kind of undercut by this, but there's a greater truth to all this. There's a greater truth to the story that I want to emphasize. And that is that when there's disasters like this, when there's horrible things, Humans, we as humans need to see a reason for it. We need to feel like there's some purpose to that. Even if there isn't, we want to feel a something good will come out of it or that God was with us, even in the worst of circumstances. So I feel like the story, even though it may not be technically true, it underscores a greater truth about how people view this fire and how horrible it was for people who um, had to live through it. Just a couple things on the cause of the fire. I've discussed that it's still un, of unknown origin. Um, one thing I will say, I had, I've had a number of conversations with fire. I'm not a fire expert. I'm not, I'm not a firefighter. I, I, I leave that to the, to the professionals. But I've had discussions with some fire engineers who are very interested in this fire and are baffled at its speed. Um, but this is an interesting photo that uh, one of them shared with me um, and shows basically that the fire emerged from the Melody Lounge, came through this area, and behind us, what we're looking, oops, looking back on it, is the main dining area. Notice the ceiling. Notice the curve of the ceiling. And he speculates the fire came in, maybe that's why it moved so fast, it was shot like a bullet because of the, because of the configuration of this roof. We don't know that, but it's, a, it's another interesting theory that adds to this, to the mystery about the fire. Um, 
Another reason I wanted to tell the story is that there actually are some great stories of survival. Um, you can see from this headline that, that four members of a family uh, died here. Um, Mrs. Miss, uh, the one woman, young, there was a teenager, Ann Clark. She lost her father, her mother, her boyfriend, her boyfriend's father. The only survivor were her and her boyfriend's mother. Um, she was severely, she was burned. She survived, she was physically okay. Mentally, she had years to recover. But I was able to interview her when she was in her late 80s, early 90s, I think it was. This is a picture of her with her, with her parents. And she went on to have a beautiful life with a um, husband, children, grandchildren, and um, was able to overcome the obstacles. Uh, an amazing woman there. Skip, let me skip that. <clears throat> Things keep coming up. For example, someone drew me attention, called me up and said that he had drink tickets from an uncle, someone who worked at the Coconut Grove that night, who escaped, who had drink tickets and a menu in his back pocket. And all these materials are now been do donated to an archive that really, uh, again, helped to tell the story. Here's another interesting thing. When I was talking in, in Groton, a man came up and showed me this wallet. And he, we laid out the uh, what was in the wallet. And I took a picture of it. And it's from his uncle. I think it was actually his great uncle who died in the fire. But this is all that's left. And again, I, I snapped a little bit of video on that. Let me see if I can play this. If you could tell me your name and your connection to the Coconut Grove. Joseph Short. My uncle was Joseph Strand Fire. He died in the Coconut Grove. And how did you happen to come by his wallet? It's been handed down through the family. It, uh, my grandparents had it long after he passed away. Um, and it was given to my mother to pass it on to me. I named after it. And you said there was $1 in the wallet when you found it's been there for Tell me about, do you know anything about him? What was his, his so that's his life? part of my kind of goal in all of this is to know more about him. I've heard nothing but wonderful things about him. All of the uh, sympathy cards speak of him glowingly. Um, and I just want to know who my uncle was. I know I knew his sister. I know both his brothers, my uncles, and my mom, and my grandparents. I just don't know him. Go ahead. He was actually named, named for him. So you can see the thing about this fire, and sorry about the cat, which was decided to jump on me. Um, the thing about this fire is that I am looking at it now as a generational trauma. There were the original victims and survivors, but this gets carried on through the, through the um, generations. I've had people coming up and they're still searching for information about relatives that they that they lost, that they lost or never knew, but they want to know what's happened, um, and so I think that's an important reason why I've continued to go back to this fire to write about it because I'm still seeking answers. I'm still trying to get to those people. And there's been a number of new developments, which I think are very, very exciting. The actual site of the coconut. This is the actual site of the coconut grove, and today it's um, been uh, covered with uh, luxury condos. It's, it's it, as I said, it's a very expensive area of Boston now, and now luxury condos have been built there. Uh, this is a plaque that was in the sidewalk near where the revolving doors were uh, in uh, the old club. And this was it's, this is interesting history is made by a survivor of the of the fire, and this has been the only the only memorial that the city has put up about this fire was this plaque. It's a nice plaque, but there's a plaque in the ground. And when the condo uh, was built there, they asked for it to be moved. They didn't want it in front of their building. So it's moved some distance away. So it's no longer near the entrance of the uh, revolving door. This caused a little problem. So this is where it is now. Um, one important development though, is that the, some a street that was called Shawmut Street Extension has been renamed Coconut Grove Lane. Again, another memorial, another way to recognize um, that something happened here in this fire. There was a, there is a very good documentary, and I'm not just saying that because I'm in it. There's a really nice documentary about the fire, Six Locked Doors, 
like Sea of Coconut Grove. You can you can buy it or you can wait. It's gonna it it airs on PBS every now and then. It's an excellent documentary. It really gets into a lot of issues. And then there's an effort to build a memorial to the victims of this fire. This photo was just taken on Monday. This is at an event at the side of the Coconut Grove in which uh, survivors were there. Um, no, actually the children's survivors were there. There's no, there's only two survivors left that we know about. But the children's survivors there, Mayor Wu was there. And there was a lot of discussion of what, what would be a good way to keep the memory of this tragedy alive. And this is something that um, uh, I was very, very gratified to see. And I'm gonna tell you more about the memorial in just a sec, but I wanna draw your attention to the wrapping behind them. That's the condos, this is the condos. Guess what? They've had a lot of problems with leakage. For, so for some reason, this is this expensive condo, it's now wrapped like a Christmas present because they're doing work to try to prevent linkage. For some reason, water keeps wanting to drip on the site. I have no reason why, but that is what they tell me. So what is going to happen hopefully next year, that's what we're aiming for, is to have a memorial placed not at the site because there's no room anymore, but placed in Statler Park, which is nearby. This is a picture of the park. And as you can see, it's, it's, very, it's just a few, um, it's, it's not very far from the actual club. The blue square is where the club is and that's where Statler Park is. And this is the proposed um, design for this memorial. In other words, it will be, a, it will be an arches that will mimic the arches that were, that were at the front door of the Coconut Grove. And it will be etched with the names of the victims of the fire, all 490 people. Um, and, and that's just a start. It may be that there's a memorial, then there'll be events, there might be some interactive exhibits, but the idea is to create a memorial where people can come learn about this fire, younger people can learn about this fire, and think about the lessons that it holds for today, and think about why we need fire regulations, why we need to be ever vigilant against fire. Look at the station nightclub fire, the ghost ship fire, um, other nightclub fires. This is a problem that keeps happening. So it behooves us to keep repeating these particular lessons of the fire. If you, uh, here are some resources on the fire, um, coconutgrove.org, very good thing. There's a lot of stuff on the net, not all of it's as accurate. So these are the best sites if you wanna find real accurate information uh, about the fire, Boston Fire Historical Society, the NFPA, National Fire Protection Association, um, these would give you, um, I, I recommend this coconutgrove.org. It's very well put together, a lot of good research. Uh, if you're looking for information about your, your own family members, this is a good place to start. Of course, you can always buy my book, which is available in bookstores and online bookstores, but also in libraries. So uh, I, I really thank you for listening. It's a very short summary of this fire. Uh, but like, let me emphasize, I think it, it gives us lessons, it gives us uh, um, details that we have to continue to repeat and to remind ourselves that fire, can, we have a lot of new equipment, technology, sprinklers and all that, but fire is still is a deadly foe and we need to stay ever vigilant about that. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing and we can take some questions. Please put them in the chat um, and Robert will relay them to me. And um, I thank you for coming out this evening. So Stephanie, wonderful job as expected. Uh, yeah, let's take uh, roughly 10 to 15 minutes of audience questions. Uh, Pat would like to know, do we know how the bus boy escaped? Yes, uh, people have asked me that. Basically, the bus boy was down in the Melody Lounge, with Stanley. And so when the fire started to spread, he and the bartender and other employees frantically tried to put it out. They didn't run, they really tried to put it out, but it started to spread. And then what they tried to do was they tried to herd people in that area to go into the kitchen because there was a, there was a door to the kitchen um, right off the Melody Lounge. There was a whole complex downtown. And so you're trying, and they managed to get a number of people to go down um, into the kitchen. But as I said, people tend to go out the way they came in. So a lot of people came down the stairs into the Melody Lounge. So instead of following the instructions, they went up the stairs 
actually following the fire and then tried to get out the door at the top of the stairs, pressing on it and getting trapped there. Some people actually made it around the corner. Some people tried to go get their coats and delayed a little bit. And then they tried to get out the um, revolving doors. Stanley and other people were was among the group that went through the kitchen and managed to get out some windows. They broke through some windows in the kitchen. So they got out from under the club and that's how, how he escaped. Um, and he went searching for his friend, um, Joseph Treg Tregelfara, that was the man who's, that was the man, the wall, that's the one who owned the wallet. So they were very good buddies actually. Um, he, uh, Joseph had helped Stanley get the job there. So he went looking for his friend and couldn't I, find him, was distraught. Okay, yeah, other questions? Uh, yes, uh, Karen uh, watches this. Thank you for the interesting presentation. Judy asks, how did Joe Short's family get the wallet? That is a good question. I think they probably got it when they identified the body. He didn't yeah. say specifically, but many people I, I'm, I basically, they would have, many families were asked to identify bodies. Mm -hmm. And there was a real effort on the part of uh, the hospitals to keep people with their effects. In fact, a nurse, one nurse was actually assigned to guard the bodies because some of them were very badly burned and the only way you could identify them were what, what was on them. So there was a real effort to keep um, artifacts with them. So likely, I don't know if it's certain, but I'm pretty certain, they would have been called to the morgue to identify the body and they would have been given his his remain, his wallet. Uh, Anne uh, wants to thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, Mary wants to know what happened to the band leader, Mickey Alpert? Oh, Mickey Alpert um, is very interesting uh, case. Actually, um, I'm, I'm very good friends with the Alpert family, his, his like great niece, I think it is. He escaped. He was actually photographed wearing a woman's white coat, which was always considered very, very, um, a new, uh, very odd. He managed to escape. He was on the main dining floor, and he saw he saw the he saw the fire coming in. He managed to get out in the door behind the stage. He was traumatized. He was traumatized by it because he almost didn't get out, and he he you know people were pouring out, and many people were burned. He was traumatized it because he was once. He was a former owner. Remember, he was a former owner of the club. He was back at the club um, entertaining the people that night. So he was actually there. And um, he, uh, so he managed to get out through that back state, the entrance by the stairway, he and a number of other people. Um, but he too was traumatized by it. He later moved to New York and kind of left the Boston area. Uh, Joseph says, I'm very happy that we finally have a memorial coming, but why did it take so long? It's a very, very good question. A um, couple, couple of things. One, um, at the time, the, the Coconut Grove was a big event in Boston, but against the backdrop of World War II, it was not a big event. I mean, it was tragedies happening all the time there. And I think that the country was dealing with that mm. kind of loss. There, you might say the people wanted to put it aside. It was so horrible, people didn't want to think about it. Paul Benziquid, who wrote this really good book right at, about five, 10 years after the fire, um, he was told no one wants to read about that. No one wants to read it. They want to put it aside. They don't want to think about it. Survivors, some of them never talked about it till years later. The city didn't want to draw attention to it because they were culpable. They were they could be considered culpable because Barney Wolanski did a, cut a lot of corners and people just winked at him. So he was able to, uh, they found out later he had unlicensed electricians working there. He kept doors locked. Um, he had, he contributed a lot of money to, a, I mean, he was very close to Mayor Tobin, the guy, the mayor at the time. So Mayor Tobin, um, Actually, at one point, it was it was said that when someone said when an electric, electrician asked him, uh, do, "Don't we need to get permits?" and he and Wolanski reported said, "No, no, no. Tobin and I fit, meaning Tobin and I understand." Um, and ironically enough, Tobin became governor, and he was the one who 
pardoned Molanski was in jail. But the truth is, it took 50, it did take 50 years to just have that plaque. So it's taken a long time. You know, um, I've only lived in Boston about 30 years. So, you know, the people here, you might answer that. I, I don't know. Ultimately, I think people wanted to push it aside. A lot of people tried to keep it keep it alive, but it kind of got pushed aside. Um, yeah. Melanie uh, has a rumor she wants to know if you've heard and mm -hmm. if you can debunk it or not. Um, I heard years ago that there was a young man who was in the fire, was for many months in the hospital, uh, but survived and returned to his family home in Iowa. Uh, he was on his family's farm tractor when it tipped over and he was burnt to death. Not sure if this is true or not. Had you uh, heard that, Stephanie? It is absolutely true. The guy's name was Clifford Johnson. Clifford Johnson underwent, was burned extraordinary. He, they didn't think he was going to live. He was burned to a crisp, basically, in the fire. Um, but they managed to save his life through the doctors, through intense nursing, through his own personal courage. Um, there, I, I have an account of his him in the in the book. It's harrowing. It's harrowing. So he managed to survive. He married one of his nurses, went back to his hot life, and then he 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 basically died. His vehicle overturned. I forget what kind of vehicle overturned. He died in a fire. Yeah, mm -hmm. horrible. But it's uh, true. Michelle's yeah. Michelle says great presentation, very informative and revealing. Uh, great question from Mary Ellen. She asks, well, first she says, thank you for making us aware of all this. And she asks, what can we as individuals and groups do to help memorialize the victims and survivors, as well as improve fire safety, especially in older buildings that may not have sprinkler systems? Well, that's a very good question. And the two, one, one is that they are, if, if you're interested in contributing to the memorial fund, they, they are accepting um, donations. So I a little bit here, a little bit there, that's not so bad. The other thing is to um, hold um, informational sessions, particularly in schools, I think, to, to uh, and, and work with your local fire departments. Um, local fire departments are always ready. Most of them are always ready to come speak to groups, speak to um, community action committees about what they think would be helpful. They are the experts. They face this every day. So I would say, if you're really interested in that, work with your local um, fire department and develop um, some community outreach with them because they would be happy to tell you why they want the fires, the, the, what the, they want the fires, they, the fire precautions that they do want. Um, and there's other things like um, there's a whole move to have sprinklers in homes now. And I'm kind of like, oh, I don't want a sprinkler system. My home wife went off. But apparently there's a real push to that's where fire deaths are happening now. They're not happening in public buildings. They're happening in homes for many reasons. And so there's a whole effort now to, in new construction, not retrofitting, but in new construction in single family homes, put in a sprinkler system because mm -hmm. it will save your life because we burn, furniture burns faster today because of the plastics, the other materials and the way construction, we are actually building homes that are less safe than they used to be. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, Julie says, fantastic talk. Thank you so much. I will be reading more about this now that you've brought it to my attention. Uh, Anita would like to know, did the families ever get financial settlements? Oh, that's that's a great question. Um, if you consider $100 or less financial help, maybe. Um, no, Walensky did not have insurance. It was turned out he did not have insurance. And so, uh, and I talked to the lawyer, actually I had, um, I spoke with the lawyer who represented the victims. And so he tried very hard to get compensation, but a couple of things. One was, one was the, uh, there was um, no insurance. Uh, they did find a cache of liquor hidden in the coconut grove that Walensky was hiding to avoid paying taxes on it. It was sold, raised about $100,000. That's how much it was. The government swooped in and took that money. So they couldn't, couldn't use it. So there wasn't a lot of compensation. There was, no, there was not the kind of compensation we have today. On the other hand, the Red Cross and hospitals donated so much of the care. 
a lot of the, those people did not have to pay for their medical care, or if they did, it was minimal. They didn't have to go bankrupt. The Red Cross, for example, did a great job and work. I read the reports. They went in and, and they did things like they bought, a lot of the musicians lost instruments in the fire. They bought new instruments for them. They supported some families. So there was more of a structure of helping people with, cope with the medical with the medical costs. That didn't mean they, they didn't suffer. Um, so th that was a little muted, but they really, today they would, there would have been insurance these people would each get like millions of dollars, but that did not happen. A lot of them got less than a hundred dollars, maybe $50 for this. Uh, Karen, I apologize in advance. I'm probably going to mispronounce the name, uh, but Karen says, thank you um, for your very informative talk. I look forward to buying your book. Uh, my uncle, Arthur uh, Zenadult, uh, died in the fire. Oh, so, wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, Karen, thanks for coming tonight, and sorry, so sorry for your sorry, loss. Sorry. Uh, 80, 80 years later, I'm, uh, oof. Uh, Hope uh, says, thank you for the great talk. Saul says, uh, thank you for a great informative talk. Uh, why do you think no city officials were ever taken to task for this horrible event? That, um, I talked about that very question with a guy named Charlie Kenny, who was Kenny. Kenny was a, Charlie Kenny was a firefighter. His father was a firefighter who fought at the Coconut Grove and was so injured by, was so injured by that, that he had to retire. Bear with me. Charles Kenny had a son also named Charles Kenny and Charles Kenny was also a firefighter, younger, but he became fascinated with the Coconut Grove. And he was convinced there were a lot of payoffs. There was a lot of dirt happening. And so there were, just a lot of shenanigans. For example, there was indictments brought against about 10 people in the Coconut Grove. Um, there was, I think, Walansky was the main one who served time. There's one other person who did serve some time. But really, when you think about it, it should have been more city officials, and it wasn't. And even at the time, people were writing letters to the editor saying, this is all going to be hushed up. There's a great story about it, a name, guy named Nako McCormick. His, his brother was John McCormick, who was this, the uh, representative of Congress, very, very well-known political family in Boston. The story is told that uh, Nako lost his daughter in the fire. And at the wake, Mayor Tom Tobin came to comfort him and he punched him out because he blamed the city officials for doing that and he felt they would not be punished so he went ahead and knocked him knocked him out i don't know if that's true or not it's one of those stories that's repeated over and over again but there 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 was a sense of frustration that they weren't going to be able to hold the city responsible for for the conditions of the fire and this is they had hours and hours of testimony they had they had a trial they had an investigation but it was kind of kept quiet. Um, and there's some other aspects of it. I, I, I just say one little story and then we'll get to the last question, but somebody was threatening somebody. I know that because there were threats made against a reporter. There were threats made against the lawyer who was representing the survivors. There were threats made against the investigators. There were even threats made against Jacques Renard's family. And he wasn't even involved with it. People would call up and say, if you know what you're, it's good for you, just lay off this coconut grove stuff. We don't know who that was. We don't know why that was. But we do know that some, somebody was trying to threaten, was literally calling up and threatening people, telling them not to investigate. I'm waiting for a deathbed confession about that. I haven't got it yet. So folks, I'm mindful of the time. We'll just take uh, two or three more questions and comments. Uh, Hope says, sadly, the adage, those who forget history are doomed to repeat it, uh, proves true when the station nightclub with the station nightclub fire, uh, where no city officials were held accountable there either. Uh, and then sort of uh, some parallels in similar circumstances uh, with that fire. Um, let's let's uh, debunk another rumor, or perhaps you can confirm it. Uh, Andrea says, I've been told that Barbara Walter's father was the owner of the club. Is that true? Uh, it's not true, but Barbara Walter's father, Lou Walters, owned the Latin Quarter which was another club nearby. So he was a club owner, not of the Coconut Grove. He, it, was a, it was a club that was, that was uh, open nearby. Um, and I did some research on that for my book, Drinking Boston. Um, and so, um, 
So, and, and the Latin Quarter, there, there were a number of, sometimes it's hard to trace who, who owned what, but definitely he was not an owner of the Coconut Grove, but he did own a nightclub in the Boston area called the Latin Quarter. Uh, I don't want to get too morbid here, but uh, Diane asks, how did most of the victims die? Uh, were they burned to death or was it uh, smoke inhalation or maybe something else? Um, it was a mixture of smoke inhalation and burns. Um, there were, um, there was a multitude of different things. A lot of uh, burn, a lot of people would be brought to the hospital and they didn't have a mark on them, but they had died because of the, they breathed the superheated air. Um, and that was something. What there wasn't a lot of was broken bones. See, people said, oh, they, they trampled over each other and killed each other in a panic. No, they, they did trample over each other and there were some of those injuries, but they, but the, 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 they couldn't, they just couldn't get out. And it, the, the um, people didn't cause their own deaths. It was really the smoke and the, because it moved very quickly through the club. Some people survived. One person survived because he, he breathed in the superheated air and he just passed out. And he went down to the ground where it's cooler. The rest of his party, he, he had stood up, got hit by that, fell down. His rest of the party died. He lived because he was, under, he was on the cool, uh, he, was on, he was below that fire moving through. It was a little peculiar. I mean, one of the things I talk about in this book is this sense of who lived, who died, and, and the role of fate. In a lot of that, so it, it, it's it's difficult. But there there were numerous causes of death, some of which were were very uh, mysterious. So I think we will stop the Q and A there. I do want to acknowledge there was about uh, twelve to fifteen comments and questions we just didn't have a chance to get to. Uh, additionally, we did not have time for folks to share stories, which I do apologize. Uh, but I do want to try to. Um, stay within our you know roughly 60 minute time frame here um so i guess stephanie what, what's next for stephanie i uh, are you writing a, a another book on a different chapter of boston history are we appearing in any more documentaries are we writing articles what are, what are we doing right now well a, cu a couple things actually one is i've um with a group of people with a group of uh, people from the friends of the boston harbor islands we have are going to be reprinting publishing basically uh, a diary that was kept in 1891 by four women who went out to Great Brewster Island uh, for, for two weeks. It's like a girl's night out in, eight, in for, for Victorian women. It's a happy book as opposed to this book, which is not so happy, but it's a, it's, it, they, they, they went out to this island, they kept a journal with photographs and illustrations of their experience. It's like a Facebook of 1891, and we are reproducing it with the beautiful illustrations of photographs. We're putting it in context. And we hope that it will be of interest to people who are interested in women's lives and Victorian era Boston um, and the literature. They, they filled it with poetry. So it's, it's, a, it's a, their journal is a wonderful document and we're trying to bring it to life. And then I do have a novel that I've written and the publisher tells me it'll come out in 2023. Um, it's called Cat Dreaming and yes, there are cats in it. What can I say? There you go. Well, Stephanie, I thank you so much for being so generous with your time and uh, talking about such an important uh, topic with us um, on the 80th anniversary. Um, and uh, so, folks, I again, just uh, before we go, I uh, want to thank all 150 of you or so uh, that tuned in. want to thank the Friends of the Tewksbury Library for sponsoring. want to thank the libraries in Newton, Ashland, Rockport, Groveland, Clinton, Danvers, Belmont, and Wilmington for helping spread the word about tonight's event. Look for an email for me uh, later tonight with a link to uh, this recording, a link to a feedback survey, and information about some other upcoming virtual author visits that might be of interest. And uh, Stephanie, any last words? No, just thank you very much. And um, what I might say is there's a number of people uh, who are continuing to research this fire. So save those stories. Uh, if you have one, contact me, go ahead. And I, I may pass them on to other people who are doing some research. You can get me through my website um, because we wanna keep all these stories alive. Great. All right, thank you so, so much, Stephanie. I'll include your contact info, your website info in the email I send out. So thank you all so much. Go Patriots and everyone have a great night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.